Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Craig Johnson. He's a New York Times bestselling author with 15 novels, two novellas, and a pile of short stories, mostly about hard scrabble lawmen fighting crime in the untamed plains and mountains of Wyoming. He's best known for creating the character of Walt Longmire, who is just such a lawman. He's not much for cell phones, because there ain't exactly much coverage out in that open space. But he'll put you down and hogtie you to bring you to justice. And I don't know if I'm talking about Walt or if I'm talking about Craig anymore. Anyway, co-hosting with Pete is another amazing author and our dear friend Jim DeFelice. Pete and Jim talk with Craig about being a man's man with a pen in his hand and his process of conveying a uniquely American experience. You're going to love this conversation. Here's our guest today, Craig Johnson. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Craig Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Craig Johnson. I'm the New York Times bestselling author of the Walt Longmire series, and I'm really glad to be here on Break It Down. And now, the Break It Down show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, the Break It Down show is proud to have Craig Johnson on. And we also have another New York Times bestseller on the line with us here because we have in-house author expert Jim DeFelice. And uh, Jim likes the West just like Craig does. And before we go anywhere, I want to steal Craig's line that he says that his wife says about him. He, you know, he wrote Longmire, and Longmire for Craig is the guy that he wants to be in about 10 years, except for he's getting us off to a slow start. I didn't say it as good as your wife does, but... There's a lot of great stuff about okay. you. There's a lot of great stuff about you out there. I want to not focus on the things that are out there, like why Longmire and all that kind of thing, and get into deeper topics. But just first off, thanks for coming out. You've got a new Longmire novel coming out, 14, 15th novel, two novellas, and a bunch of art, uh, short stories. So there's a lot out there about you already on Longmire, and I'm just super stoked to have you on. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's a great thing to be here. Like, it's really nice to be able to do this from my ranch. Like, I, you know, live in the, I guess my ranch is, you know, just outside of a little town of 25 called U Cross. I'm in northern Wyoming. Like, so any chance I get to do this type of thing where I actually get to sleep at home, I'm really kind of pleased with, I have to admit. So. Well, since I have two authors, I'm going to mostly shut up and I'm going to let Jim ask questions because uh, I can't imagine what you guys could talk about. So I'm going to get out of the way. Well, actually, before we get to any sort of, you know, deep questions, I want to know when Craig, when you say that you want to, you know, that your character is uh, who you want to be in 10 years, was that 10 years from book one or is that 10 years <laughs> now? Does it keep going? Well, that, that kind of puts me on the spot because that means that I should have made some kind of advancement along those lines in the last, you know, 14 years. And I'm not so sure I have. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you, you get those kind of questions an awful lot of the time. Like, it, and I show up, you know, generally, you know, wearing what I normally wear every day. Like, at whenever I'm doing book events, it's a, you know, pair of cowboy boots and jeans, you know, and a hat, you know. And so uh, generally people are going to make, you know, some kind of a connection connection, you know, between uh, the character and, and, and who you are. And I guess also, you know, the fact that I write Walt in, you know, first person that I guess, you know, leads people to believe, you know, that, that maybe I am the character, but, you know, obviously I'm the lowly scribe, look at who just writes about the character. And, you know, I, there are things that I, you know, admire, you know, in Walt. I mean, I think that whenever you're writing, there's always going to be certain aspects, especially of a fictitious character that, you know, that you're going to you would like to aspire to look at, I mean, there, there are also things about him that, you know, that I don't aspire to. I mean, you know, he's had a lot of tragedy in his life with the experiences that he had in the Vietnam war, like that with the death of his wife of, you know, just uh, you know, a lot of things that he's had to deal with over the years that I really haven't, you know, I've, I've led a kind of a charmed life like that and haven't had to deal with a lot of things that he has like that. But you know, there are certain aspects of his character that I admire. I mean, he's very patient. He's very, steadfast you know he's dogged he's very intelligent he's extraordinarily well read he's a smart guy like that and so i like to think that you know a lot of the reasons why it is that people enjoy reading the books or watching the television show are the same reasons why it is that you know that i enjoy writing about walt you know he's he's a little bit different from a lot of the protagonists that you tend to see you know is in crime fiction 
who tend to be the you know the six foot two of twisted steel and sex appeal kind of guy. I mean, <laughs> you know, Walt's a little bit you know more like us. You know, he's a, he's overweight, he's over age, he's overly depressed. You know, but he still gets up in the morning and tries to do the job. And you know, to me, there's a, a heroism to that. In many ways, you know, sometimes it kind of goes unsung. For me, that's one of the the, the more appealing aspects of the character. You know, there there are some parallels, and I, and I realize that writers are always getting confused with their characters, but you were in law enforcement uh, at one point, too, right, before you... Before you I got had a lot of experiences like that that I think that you have to draw from like that, but, you know, as you, you know, from being a writer like that, I mean, whenever you enter into something as specific, you know, as a character or something, because that's kind of one of the elements that I was trying to get across whenever I even started with Walt was something that was different, you know, because I had read maybe not a lot of crime fiction, but enough to know that, you know, the majority of it was about like detectives in big cities and all that type of stuff. And, and I was fortunate enough to run into two DCI investigators here in Wyoming, where we have, you know, one crime lab and I asked them, I said, you know, how long does it take you guys to get, you know, DNA evidence? And they said about six months. <laughs> and I thought, OK, well, that certainly is a little bit different than, you know, the way these type of things are usually portrayed, you know. And so I thought, well, you know, what if you did the sheriff of the least populated county in the least populated state? You know, it would kind of fo force you to you know, focus more on character and place, you know, which I think are you know, where the, the real writing comes from. And so that's kind of, you know, the direction that I went. And so an awful lot of the, the personal experience that I drew for the character was helpful. But what was even more helpful was doing ride-alongs with the sheriffs, you know, here in Wyoming and up in Montana. There are counties, you know, in, in both of these states, certainly maybe more so in, in Wyoming, where you know, we have counties that are the size of New Hampshire or, you know, Vermont, or I think Fremont County is like the size of Maryland. And, you know, you have limited resources, you know, and limited funding, you know, to do the type of things that, I don't know, you see on television or you see in books and everything. And, you know, it's always going to come down to the money. You know, what what can you afford to do, you know, as a, as a county sheriff? And, you know, that seemed to kind of like draw me into an area that I thought where the writing might be better than just being plot driven. One of the terms I think I hate more than any other one in writing is the page turner. I really don't like that term because it seems to me that all you're trying to do is get somebody to just rush through your book as you go through the gymnastics of some plot, then finish it up, you know, and, and, you know, people will set that book down and, you know, maybe it was a hectic and wild ride, but are they going to remember anything from that? There's a, <laughs> I'm not going to give away names, but whenever I'm on tour, one of my favorite things to do is uh, look and see, you know, which books are the most abandoned, you know, on, on airlines, <laughs> you know, like which ones are stuffed, you know, in the back, the, you know, the, the pouch of the seats there to see who gets, you know, abandoned. And uh, there's this one author that gets abandoned more than any other I've ever seen. <laughs> And one time there was a woman sitting across the aisle from me who happened to be reading one of those books. And she finished it up. Look at it, and I said, so how was your book? And she goes, it was great. It was really, really good. Look at it, and I said, wow, so what is it about? And she goes, um, it was um, – <laughs> there was a boat in it, and there was a guy. <laughs> and I was like, okay, boy, I don't ever want that to happen when somebody finishes my book. I would rather have them, you know, remember a few details, you know, rather than, you know, that it was, you know, a wild ride and, you know, you know 300 pages and now it's done and I can't remember what it was about, you know, more, you know, more than two minutes later. I have to ask you, though. Given that little story there, have you ever come across anybody that's been, whether it on a plane or the diner, or wherever, have you ever come across somebody reading your book and what happens if they didn't know who you were? You know, do you strike up a conversation or, or do anything? I'm not that bold. I'm really not. I, I've actually, you know, run into a few people who've actually been reading my books, but I, I haven't had the nerve to say, how was the book <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. I'm not quite sure if I, I don't know, maybe I'm not brave enough to hear what they say, you know, or something like, you know, I, oh, this is lousy. I'm really not trying to finish it at all. Like that, but, but no, I've ran into, I've had a couple, like a, there was actually, I think there was a, sh the only time that I ever did it, there was a gas station in Hardin, Montana, and there was a copy of Cowboys and Indians magazine, and I had a short story that won the Tony Hillerman Award and was actually in that month's issue. And when I came in to pay for my gas, the, the young woman was sitting there at the counter, and she had that Cowboys and Indians magazine open and was reading uh, uh -huh. the short story. 
And I looked at her and I go, you know, is, is you know, are you, are you, is this your magazine? Are you reading it? She goes, yeah, yeah. I look at it and I said, well, is it the short story? Is it any good? And she goes, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Look at it. And that's all she said. And I was like, okay, Thank good. God. That's, that's all. Well, I'll take that and run with it. Like, that's what I'll do. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that had an effect on my ability to actually, yeah. you know, n- n- to ask those questions anymore. I thought, okay, you got a base hit. Just take it and run with it. Okay. <laughs> so, Craig, my, my next question then is, is that, you know, all of us artists, these creators you know a lot oftentimes our tightest circle is the are the hardest people to sell things to you know like in my hometown yes people listen to the show but like it should be like crazy you know the show's really successful but but it's not you know and i'll I'll say hey have you listened to the show i don't care if you have or haven't but have you and they're like oh yeah 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 what's your favorite episode uh uh all right i haven't listened you know (laughs) so can you sell books in you cross or or like i just can't sell two books in you (laughs) cross Well, you know, my grandfather used to have the best phrase about that, which was biblical, which is the prophet hath no honor in his own country. <laughs> um, and I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, around here, you know, it, it's not Craig the writer. It's like, oh, yeah, Craig, because you got that ranch, you know, out near you cross. Like, and they're more concerned about me making sure that I get my fences, you know, fixed than they are about, you know, <laughs> the next book, you know, or, or the next episode of, you know, the TV show or anything. I do pretty well like that. I mean, the, the, like in Buffalo, like that, which is about 20 miles away, there's a bookstore. And then in Sheridan, you know, the other direction, 28 miles away, there's another bookstore. And then they, they, they sell my books you know, pretty briskly like that. But then again, you know, we also have a lot of tourism in the state of Wyoming. And, you know, there are a lot of people that come through on their way, you know, from the Black Hills, headed over to Yellowstone like that. And so they're always looking for local authors and local literature like that. And that can work sometimes for you and sometimes it can't, you know. And so... I think one of the things that kind of hedges the bets a little bit is is that it, you know it's a it's a big publisher it's you know they're, it, they're you know it says you know they're New York Times about selling books there's a a TV show on Netflix you know and so they'll take a chance you know to maybe pick up that book and maybe read it they might not get burnt you know as as badly as they might get burnt with what I tend to refer to as my uncle's uh, branding in 1948 was the greatest time ever and i've written a 48 page self-published book about it and will you introduce me to your agent you know kind of situation (laughs) where you know it's you know it's going to be a little bit of harder sell i guess to try and (laughs) to get out there like that but i mean that that's that's always going to be the big question too like that whenever you're you know whenever you do write you know or whenever you you hope to get published or anything along those lines the getting published is not a dirty word you know i mean you know there are a lot of literary workshops you know in places you go like that you know and you get a lot of that nebulous you know, what well, I just write to write and I just write to discover things about myself. That's all fine and well, and that's great, you know, but if you really want to be a writer, you know, and you really want to get a message out there, then, you know, you're going to have to get an agent, you're going to have to get a publisher, you're going to have to go out and go on tour, you're going to, have to do all of those things, you know, that come along with the going, doing the writing. And, you know, I'm, I'm always, you know, whenever I'm doing workshops or, you know, dealing with, you know, young writers, you know, and, and their first question is, you know, well, what's it like to go have a beer with Lou Diamond Phillips, you know, or what's it like to, to be on tour in France, you know, or things like that. I'm always thinking to myself, okay, you're only talking about, 5% of, you know, what writing yeah. is really about. I mean, the majority of what you're doing is going to be sitting in an empty room with your imaginary friends and typing about them. And so if you're not really comfortable with the idea of doing that, then, you know, you're probably going to have a problem on your hands. But I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, also a question of like you make choices, you know, and so whenever I decided to write about this guy, you know, who was, you know, the the sheriff of the least populated county, least populated state, I knew it was kind of maybe going to go in a different direction than the majority of the stuff that was out there. And that's a choice that you have to make, you know, early on too, since, you know, there, what, there's something like, I think, 250 uh, hardback mystery novels published a month. And so to be seen, you know, in that herd or to be noticed in that herd, you know, you you better think about doing something different, and and that's what you know what it all boils down to, trying to do something different. I think. Yeah, you know, from having a lot of authors on the show, I've learned this thing: like writing of the book is yeah, it's exceptionally hard, and one of the hardest things you've done in your life that first time you do it. Now, welcome to the holy crap! It's even harder to sell this thing. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> like it's the hardest thing or, ever. Or, you 
know, <laughs> or the best thing in the world happens and you actually do get picked up. And the next thing they say is we need another book right? in another. six months, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and now we need another one in six months and another one in six months and another one in six months. But I mean, you know, it's like first world problems. I mean, you know, you, you don't ever want to, you know, you know, be too critical of the situation yeah. like that because, you know, boy, you know, how wonderful is it, you know, to have all of this stuff happen. And, you know, I mean, to have people be interested, I mean, to have a marvelous show like yourself, like a contact me and say, hey, you know, can, you know, can we get on here and we, can we talk? You know, I mean, you know, there were all of those years, you know, where you're out there just, you know, swimming in the ocean without a life preserver, you know, typing and typing <laughs> away every day and thinking to yourself, is this ever going to amount to anything? Is it ever going to go anywhere? Is anybody ever going to be remotely interested in reading this stuff? And so there's a girding of the loins, I think, that you have to have, like at the to do this kind of thing for a living. Like there, there's got to be a certain amount of mental toughness, you know, that has to go along and a hope, you know, and a belief, you know, in what it is that you're doing. And nothing is as hard as that first one. Nothing is as hard as that first one trying to get that done. Except um, for the next that story one. that I always, yeah, well, yeah, you know, but at least you're not reinventing the wheel, you know, at least at that uh, point, you've, you know, you've actually said to yourself, okay, well, I, I have actually done this. I've just got a much shorter timeline, you know, to try and do it is all. So, yeah. Well, uh, between the two you know, of you, you guys have written easier before though. Yeah. I, I want to know how about some, some of your pre Longmire history, you know, I mean, because I think some people think, you know, oh, you just kind of just popped into existence. And, you know, what kind of led you to your success, actually, I guess would be the way really to phrase that. huh? I, you know, and then like, then you have to look at it and say to yourself, well, then, you know, then you have to consider yourself a success, which I I think is a big mistake, you know, like, along the way. <laughs> I think an, an awful lot of the time that, you know, whenever, I, I used to make the joke that whenever your name was bigger than the title of your book, you were done. You know, your, your artistic <laughs> aspects of your writing life, you know, were pretty much over. Like, and, and now that my name is bigger than the title of my books, I have to take all that back. <laughs> so, at least in hopes, you know, that, that there's still some, you know, you know, some artistic, you know, credibility to what it is that you do. I think that, you know, I mean, you know, my education, you know, was in, in writing like, at, um, but I think also the big thing for me was, is that, uh, I came from a, a family of storytellers like at that, you know, that really would like, you know, sit in rocking chairs, like on front porches or be sitting there snapping urine beans or whatever. And, you know, they would tell stories like that. And so I very early on learned that, you know, somebody who could tell a story, you know, that was a very valuable, you know, commodity. That was a very valuable trait. I mean, you know, being able to rebuild a small block engine, you know, being able to prepare a wonderful meal or stitch up a star quilt, be able to, you know, do basic electricity or, you know, plumbing or carpentry and all that. These are all valuable abilities. Like, And, you know, just, just telling a good story, knowing how to tell a good story was another one of those things that I think, you know, was kind of important. And that's kind of the way I approach the books, you know, is, is that, you know, it would be almost as if you were to go in and sit down in the Busy Bee Cafe in Durant, you know, in this fictitious town, in this fictitious county, and Longmire were to come in and sit down next to you and turn to you and say, let me tell you about what happened to me last month. You know, mm -hmm. at that point, I don't even want you to be aware that you're reading a book. I want you to fall into that world and be a part of it. And I don't know. I mean, you know, you got to trust your instincts, you know, and think that, you know, what you're doing is, is the right thing and that, that you know, you're going to try and do something a little bit different, you know, maybe than, you know, what everybody else is doing out there. But I don't know if there's ever really a point in time. I mean, I just got the the advanced reader copies from the new book, Land of Wolves, like that, that's going to be out on September 17th. And, you know, you always think that if people will ask that question. They'll say, well, you know, when did you know you'd succeeded? When did you know, you know, that this was, I, I don't know if that ever really happens. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, uh, I guess what I tend to refer to as a creative dissatisfaction in the sense that, you know, you write something or you create something like that, but you're never completely happy with it. You know, I had a good friend of mine, Mark Sprague, like that, who wrote An Unfinished Life, like that, and a number of other books, like that, from over in Cody. And I remember sitting in a bar with him one time drinking a beer, and he reaches over and, and takes a hold of one of, you know, like the book that I had sit on the table between us. And he goes, you know what you don't ever want to have happen, Craig? And I said, no, what's that? You don't ever want to pick up one of your books. And he picks up the book as an example. He opens it up to a page and looks at it and goes, ah. Uh, you know, a great man wrote that, you know, you don't ever <laughs> want to get to that point where you read your stuff, you know, and you start believing your own press, you know, where you're yeah. like, ah, uh, yes, you know, I am a magnificent writer, aren't I? <laughs> and I, think, you know, I think any kind of artist, you know, I think that that, you know, there's got to be that dissatisfaction. I think there's always got to be that, you know, 
you know, oh, well, what's your best book you've ever written? You know, well, I haven't written it yet. What's the best painting you've ever painted? I haven't painted it yet. You know, the best song you've ever written, you know, I haven't recorded it yet. I think you got to feel like, you know, you're moving towards something that you're actually attempting to try and do, you know, something different and something better each time. And that kind of goes into the other aspect of it, you know, that, that's a little bit dangerous when you're writing a series is that, you know, we've all started series of books because writing a singular book, a standalone book, you know, and writing a series, that's that's two very different breeds of cat. And I think, you know, that you can fall into a lot of traps, you know, whenever you start getting on what I tend to refer to as that gerbil wheel of, you know, putting out a book every year. You know, you better try and do something different with each one. There's a danger to that, you know, because there are a lot of people that, you know, pick you pick up your first book because they really, really like that. And they may want you, you know, as readers, you know, to reproduce that book, you know, to keep doing it over and over and over again. And there are a lot of publishers and agents, you know, who would be very happy. You know, there, there are tons of authors out there like that who were very, very popular. Like at it, and their first book, you know, really was a breakthrough book. And they just keep doing that same book over and over and over again. I desperately don't want to be, you know, one of those authors. You know, I want to try new things. I want to challenge myself, you know, as an author to try and, you know, write different things, like to deal with different social situations, you know, all of these different things. Have the characters grow, have them develop, have them change over a period of time. I think that can be the death of any series of books. I mean, whenever you pick up the first book and you really enjoyed it, and then you go and pick up the 17th book and the characters are still saying and doing the same things that they did, you know, 17 years ago, that's just not normal. That's not human. What was the evolution? You know, have you consciously plotted out, okay, well, I'm going to keep myself fresh by doing this or how, how exactly has that worked over you know, over 15 books? It's tough. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a, and you use different things, you know, you use different ways, you know, I mean, you know, obviously the first thing you do whenever you sit out, in my opinion, I don't know, this is just the, the methods that I use, you know, I'm always thinking to myself, well, what are you trying to say with this book? You know, what is it that you're trying to, what's the message that you're trying to get across, you know, to the readership? You know, what are you trying to convey? And, you know, then you have to start thinking about a couple of different other things, you know, okay, okay, well, what's the plot? You know, what are the mechanics of the storyline or investigation that are going to illustrate this message that you're trying to get across? And then, you know, like, where are these characters? You know, where are they, you know, in their evolution right now? Like, um, you know, for me... I'm, I'm writing about a, you know, a Vietnam, you know, veteran like that. He's of a certain age, you know, and got a certain, you know, the relationships that he's dealing with, you know, the things that he's getting over, the new challenges that he's facing, you know, in his life, you know, all of these things, you know, well, what, what's the storyline and what's the message like that that's going to illustrate that and allow me to evolve that character in that sense. When it comes to characters, like we've had Kat Connor on the show, and she's uh, she's got her own uh, series called the Bite Series, and she talks about the people that she writes about. They're her friends, also. So, ha- have you and and Walt sat down and had a beer? Like, how do you <laughs> outside of the book, you know? And obviously, I don't mean literally, but you know, like in, as you're creating this universe, have you had that experience? She like she has music, uh, oftentimes pops into uh-huh. her head, and it kind of themes a character or a situation for her. How does that work for you? Maybe I have to admit that maybe Walt might be the only one that I haven't like that. But I don't know what quite what that means. Like other than you know, but I do have to admit that one of my favorite quotes on writing is the one from Wallace Stegner on writing and teaching fiction, where he says the greatest piece of fiction ever written is the disclaimer at the beginning of every book that says nobody in this book is based off anybody alive or dead. <laughs> yeah. um, you know that, that what a big what a, what a crock that is. You know that that's your job is to go out and find interesting people and populate your novels with them like that. And yeah, I mean you know I, I think that, you know, obviously, you know, there, there's so many wonderful shortcuts that you can use, like in the development of character. And I, I love doing that. I love using people, you know, in my books, you know, and, and nine times out of 10, people have absolutely no idea, you know, who they are in your books. Like, and I, I remember when I was writing uh, the first Walt book, The Cold Dish, like, and I had the character the, of Lucian Connolly, who, you know, is the older sheriff that Walt goes and plays chess with, you know, on Tuesday nights yeah. at the Home for Assisted Living. Like, and I I remember sending the, you know, the, the manuscript to my brother like that to let him read it. And, you know, he called me immediately upon finishing it. And I said, well, what did you think of it? And he goes, you're dead. And I said, what do you mean? Like, and he goes, the old sheriff, the one that Walt goes and plays chess with on Tuesday night, that's our dad, Craig. 
And I was like, crap, I thought I hit that really, really well. Like, and uh, he, you know, we said, no, no. He said, he looks like dad. He acts like dad. He talks like dad. The only thing you did was change his name and cut off one of his legs. And I, I don't think it's going to work. You know, I think it's going to fool dad. And so I waited with bated breath because I had also sent a copy to my mother and father like that. And, you know, I called up my mother and she's, you know, I said, mom, has dad read the book yet? She's like, he's about halfway through it. He's really enjoying it. Like, and I said, well, good. Is you know, it's, you know, uh, and I'm trying to think of how I'm going to ask this next question. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when she comes back on and says, honey, your father thinks he's Walt Longmire. And I was like, OK, okay you know, I, I was stunned, you know, because I can't imagine two characters any further apart than those two characters. <laughs> um, and, and I, I you know, and her statement was, let's not disabuse him of that thought. Like, and so <laughs> he pretty much went to his grave pretty sure that he was Walt Longmire. But I don't know. I mean, you know, my, my wife has some really you know, astute observations about that, too. And she says, you know, well, you you, you, you say you, you pull all of these other characters characters, you know, from other people and everything. But in the final analysis, you're the only one that's in the room. You know, you, you really got to pull from yourself, you know, and to try and, you know, develop those characters, you know, and, and, you know, I, I hear a lot of authors, you know, they'll, they'll say, you know, like, oh, I have my characters and they just speak to me and they start talking and they just, you know, run off with the storylines and everything. And I don't know, I worry about people who sit in rooms by themselves and hear voices. I don't know. And, you know, and, you know, I, I write about armed people an awful lot of the time and that worries me even more when they hear voices. Again. Yeah. So see, I've got a theory on that. And my, and you can you, you see what you think like that, but my theory, is is that you know you, you've got you know two minds in here you've got your conscious mind and your subconscious mind and your conscious mind is the one that's doing all of the research it's the one that's doing all the outlines it's the one that's got the fingers on the keyboard and all of this you know and has a mind of like you know what the structure of the plot is and all of these things and then you've got your poor subconscious mind which is just kind of like a backseat driver that you just kind of like back there along for the ride you know and really has you know, can't reach the steering wheel can't reach the brake or the accelerator or anything like that but like any other backseat driver has opinions you know and maybe you know might have even you know a, a more you know liquid idea you know of you know these characters and a flowing idea of like the pacing and the structure of the novel like that you know as far as that's concerned and so every like like any other backseat driver every once in a while it throws something over the seat um you know to to you know kind of like let you acknowledge like and deal with and i think that you know a lot of times that's what it is it's not really all that spooky or otherworldly it's just your subconscious mind kind of reminding you of maybe some plot points or other things that maybe you might otherwise not be aware of before we get too much further i want to ask you about the new book that's coming out this fall and just maybe give us a sneak peek or or you know give us sure. a little reason on that to Sure. On. This one is um it, it's it's uh it was a it was a fun book to do like that because the last you know, I guess five books have kind of led to a culmination um for depth of winter with Walt, you know, probably in you know, one of the most desperate situations probably of his life. Like that but the majority of that book actually took place in Mexico um with these mm -hmm. drug cartels. And it was another opportunity to try and do something different, you know, with the books once again, you know, but then, you know, you can't truly go home, but you, you certainly have to because you can't sleep here. Like that. And so, <laughs> you know, Walt ends up, you know, going, you know, back to uh, Absaroka County um, after solving the, the issues that he has to deal with, you know, in Mexico. And as it is with a lot of these situations, you know, when you're in a situation that you know, really calls for, you know, a lot of inherent violence and th things that Walt hasn't dealt with, you know, in some ways, you know, since Vietnam, like at a, he finally gets back, you know, to Absaroka County, you know, in Wyoming. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a strange landscape for him. In many ways, he doesn't recognize it anymore the way that he used to. There's even a, a point in time, you know, when he's talking to Isaac Bloomfield over at the hospital, just, you know, he's involved in this investigation about a, a shepherd who may or may not have, you know, sagebrushed or is the term that we use here in Wyoming where, you know, you're out alone by yourself for too long and he commits suicide is what he does. Like that. And, you know, Walt, you know, is, is going through the, the, the medical information with Isaac Bloomfield, look at, and he's explaining this situation where he has these moments where he's just kind of freezing up for minutes at a time where he just doesn't move or anything and just, you know, stares off into the distance. And, you know, and Isaac's explaining to him, he says, well, you know, there, there's always, you've heard of the flight fight, you know, mechanism, like that in your response. And Walt's well, like, well, yeah, I like that. And he goes, well, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, you have, you know, two responses to something that you perceive as a threat. You either, you know, fight or you flee. Like that. And he said, sometimes, 
if, you know, the situation and the threat is so overwhelming that we can neither fight nor flee, we literally freeze up. And, you know, Walt's looking at him and he's saying, well, yeah, but if that's the case, then what the hell is it, Doc, that I'm so afraid of? Like that. And mm. Isaac Bloomfield looks at him and says, why, Walt, I would have thought that it was perfectly obvious it's yourself. The individual that Walt had to be to do the things that he had to do in depth of winter in Mexico, they're impairing him now uh, mm. in his ability to, to come back and be who he was in Wyoming. And so he's having difficulties dealing with this situation. And so there's a, the, a case, you know, that he's dealing with an investigation where there's a Basque shepherd up in the Bighorn Mountains, like at who, you know, as I say, gets bushwhacked, you know, or not bushwhacked, but uh, sagebrushed and hangs himself like that. And so they go up to, you know, to, to investigate the body and uh, discover that, you know, that, uh, you know, well, maybe he committed suicide, maybe he didn't. You know, maybe there's some mitigating circumstances that might lead to somebody, you know, maybe killing him. And then, of course, you know, to, to complicate, you know, matters, as it turns out, there's a, a, you know, evidently there's been some predation, you know, where a wolf, you know, who's come out from the Lamar Valley and the Yellowstone region over into the Bighorn Mountains has nibbled on this hanging shepherd, which kind of throws some repercussions through the town that there's a wolf scare and that there are wolves, you know, uh, around, you know, uh, every tree that are waiting to drag, you know, every child from a bus stop, you know, here in Durant and uh, makes for even more complications for Walt. Look at and. Uh, the, the wolf, as it turns out, is a, is an older alpha male that's you know been kicked off from one of the packs, you know, and he's kind of crippled up, but he's of good size, like it, and a little older, and having some trouble and gray around the muzzle and all this. And amazingly enough, our crippled up older sheriff, you know, is finds <laughs> a certain amount of uh, you know of a connection um, with this wolf, like that, and and so you know it's 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 back to the complications, you know, of uh, of a sheriff in Wyoming, and the title actually comes from a Basque proverb that a land of strangers is a land of wolves, mm. and uh, it's it's been a it's been a, a fun book to write, you know, because Walt's you know back in his element in Wyoming, and I have to admit that uh, you know that, uh, that that even though I enjoy the books, you know, that take place in different locales, like it's always a, a joy to return back to Wyoming. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. But even though I enjoy the books you know, that take place in different locales, like it's always a joy to return back to Wyoming. I wanted to ask you, Tony Toast has been on the show, and obviously you guys kind of get that region of the, uh, the nation that you're writing about. Have you had an opportunity to really kind of dig into how he sees your world? Only from reading his writing, like <laughs> more than anything else. Um, yeah. He was one of our staff writers on Longmire, and I don't know. I mean, in many ways, I'm, I'm very uh, I admire you know all of the writers that we had on the TV show because they, they're they're able to do something that that I'm incapable of doing. I go up into my loft here in my little ranch here in Wyoming. And, you know, I write, you know, all by myself, you know, they, they had more of a write by committee kind of situation, you know, with the producers and the directors and even the input you know, from the actors once the scripts finally got there like that. And uh, I, I don't work and play well with others. You know, huh. I, I <laughs> like going up there all by myself like that. And I'm just amazed, you know, at how they were able, you know, to work, you know, with all of these influences, you know, I mean, and it's so weird. I mean, Hollywood is so strange in the sense that, I mean, there was a point in time when Dodge Truck was desperate to try and get rid of that Ford Bronco that they had on the television show, you know, where, you know, even the, the advertisers, you know, were having input, you know, <laughs> how, the, how the, you know, the screenplays or teleplays were to be written. And, and to give, you know, Tony, you know, a really, you know, a, a salute, you know, what was very obvious to me whenever I would, you know, because I was a, an executive creative consultant on the show, which means I know where the porta potties are on set was what that meant. <laughs> but, uh, but one of the things they would do is, is they would, you know, they would send me the scripts to go through, you know, because I, I'm not going to be able to help them, you know, with the costuming or the setting or the, the acting or the directing or all these different things like that. But, but I, but I can help them with that world. And, you know, more importantly, I could help them, you know, with the, the language and the, the writing of that world. And what was interesting to me was it was apparent to me 
almost instantaneously whenever I would receive one of the scripts, whether or not the screenwriter had read my books. And Tony was one of the best. He was actually one of the best. You know, you could tell immediately when, you know, you, you read his scripts that he had read all of the books, that he knew the world that I had created. And that's very flattering. You think that, you know, that it would be pretty obvious that if you're going to attempt to do something along these lines that, you know, you would want to read as much of the seminal material as there is, you know, so that you can draw from that. And he did an absolutely magnificent job doing that. But, you know, but then there were other times when I would read the works of, of some of the screenwriters, you know, and I could tell, no, they, they did not, you know, mm. know the lay of the land. They didn't know the books, you know, and maybe even more importantly, they didn't know Wyoming. You know, I would catch things like, you know, they would have, you know, screenwriters write things like, you know, okay, well, we're going to, you know, run down to Denver and we'll be back in a couple of hours. And I'd be like, mm, no, you're not. <laughs> Unless that, you know, Absaroka County Sheriff's Department Learjet is available, you know, you're not going to be doing that, you know. And so kudos to Tony, like in so many ways, you know, A, for being such a wonderful writer, but B, also, you know, for circumspect like that, that he, you know, really would delve into it like that and try and find as much of material as he could, you know, to draw from like that, you know, to work on his script. You know, we've touched on this, or you've touched on this rather a couple of times, you know, about really about place and how important place is in the books, obviously the TV series. But I also wonder, you know, how much it informs just, you know, your, your writing itself, you know, kind of your, you know, not to get too esoteric here, but, you know, your existence and kind of the interplay there. I mean, obviously place is important in, in, in some way to you. Well, yeah. I mean, my my favorite quote on that is the old Studs Terkel line that nothing ever happened nowhere. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you really got to make sure like that, you know, if you're going to take that on that, you know, that you make sure that you get it right. And, you know, because it's not that difficult to be an expert on Wyoming. I mean, there are, you know, <laughs> there, there are that many, I have to admit, you know, I mean, now, now granted, I will concede the point that there are only 500,000 of us like that live here. <laughs> there is a, a very much a tone to it and a mm. feel to it. It, like at the High Plains, to the American West, especially the contemporary American West. You know, I mean, that's a tricky business. Like, at, you know, and then, you know, trying to write something, you know, as far as like, you know, the period West is concerned, you know, that, that's even more, you know, uh, conspicuous, you know, because you're going to have people that are going to have, you know, specific ideas about, you know, certain things like that. And, 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 you know, as you know, you well know as being an author, like that if you get something wrong, they are more than happy to get in touch with you and tell you all about the things <laughs> that you got wrong. Like at, and, uh, and maybe you did maybe you didn't maybe it's an opinion thing or whatever like that but uh you know th there really isn't any excuse anymore to not you know try and make sure that you get that information right and i think the ambiance you know of you know the high plains and of the rocky mountain west it's just not something that i can leave out of the books one aspect of it being so much so that you know i think it was james crumley that you know that wrote that wyoming has never been about you know indoors you know wyoming has always been about the out of doors because there is so much of it. The ninth largest state, you know, with the, the, the smallest population base. And so, you know, when one of the, the aspects of, you know, the, doing this interview, it was funny, like, I had to go back and forth like that because, you know, there is no internet, you know, I mean, the internet service here, you know, at the ranch is, it's a little dicey sometimes. Like, it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Skype, you know, is, is nine times out of ten not so much of an option. Um, mm -hmm. Cell phones don't work. I mean, I, I actually like um, writing about a world, you know, where the limitations of technology become very, very evident. I think one of the mistakes that you know, that we as, as modern people make is, is that, you know, technology can solve all of our problems. Well, mm -hmm. you know, the natural world has a way of reminding you that technology has its limits. And, you know, right when you start depending on it the most, that's when it will, you know, leave you flat. And, you know, it, it's funny because people are always asking me, why is it that Walt doesn't have a cell phone? And my immediate response is, you don't live in Wyoming, do you? <laughs> right. Because, you know, it, it becomes pretty evident pretty quick, you know, why it is. You know, I mean, yeah. we have this thing called Longmire Days, like in, in Buffalo, uh, which is kind of the basis for Durant. You know, and it's a little 5,000-person town at the base of the Bighorn Mountains here in northern Wyoming. And it's an event where we have all of the actors 
from the television show uh, come up for this one weekend. I think it's like the third weekend in July, I think, this year. And, you know, the, the actors all show up and they bring about 20,000 of their closest friends with them. And it's kind of like a FEMA disaster is what it's like, like it, because all the restaurants and all the grocery stores run out of food, all the ATMs <laughs> and banks run out of money, and everybody walks around with their cell phones looking at the little blue circle of death, you know, because they've overrun the bandwidth of the one little tower that there <laughs> is, you know, there in Buffalo. And, and of course, my favorite thing is to walk up to them and going, yeah, now you know why Walt doesn't carry a cell phone, don't <laughs> you. But you know, for me, that that's part of the joy of it, like that to have a specific, you know, geography, to have a specific area, you know, to, to write from. I mean, you know, we're in April now and, you know, people are, you know, contacting me about, you know, doing events and all these type of things. And it's, it's still winter, you know, I mean, it, it's, it was snowing last night, you know, and the wind was blowing at about, you know, I'm not joking at about, you know, 64 miles an hour towards, you know, with some of the trim off of the, the edge of, you know, one of my buildings here at the ranch and so it's you know it, whenever you've got a you know a world where you know it, it imposes itself in your life on a day-to-day -day basis well then you'd be a fool to not you know have that be a part of you know of what it is that you're writing because it's certainly a part of Walt's life there's no choice so do you find kind of a dissonance or di some sort of distance between the the tv series and the books i mean you were saying you know basically you're writing and that's kind of your own thing and then the tv is something else but and yet there's a connection and kind of you know a symbi but, well i don't know you describe it I think that, you know, well, whenever you go into, and from your experiences, you know, this is true. Like that, I mean, you, you're talking about another art form, is what you're talking about. We've all heard, you know, the horror stories, you know, going all the way back to the, the annals of the history of Hollywood, you know, of disgruntled authors, you know, who weren't happy, you know, with the way that, you know, the movies or the TV shows or whatever of their work were done. And I, I kind of put a little bit of blame, you know, on both sides. I mean, obviously, you know, there are enough unscrupulous individuals, you know, and, it, it, you know, Hollywood's kind of like drugs. There's a lot of money. So there's a lot of unscrupulous characters that are going to be involved, you know. And so, you know, you really got to kind of protect yourself by trying to work with the very best people that you can. And, you know, the, the only choice that you have in those situations is before you sign, you know, your name on the contract. I'm, I'm always unimpressed with authors who take, you know, the, the multi-million dollar contracts and then badmouth, you know, the material later. You know, it's like, well, you maybe should have done a little bit more more, you know, homework, you know, on who it was that you were working with and see what kind of work they do before being all upset, you know, with what it is that they did, you know, with your work. I think, you know, that it's, like I said, a different breed of cat. It's just, you know, what works in a book is not necessarily going to work in a television show, you know, or in a movie. You just have to try and, you know, find a compatibility and try and work with the very best people that you can work with like that, and then realize that there are going to be, you know, changes that are going to be made. With the people with Longmire, they had, you know, really wonderful track records on all of these television shows that they had done. Nip Tuck, I can go through the whole list of like all of these things that they had done, but they had a good track record. And so I thought, okay, you know, then maybe this is something that we can, you know, work together and do. And I also remember one of the first meetings that I had with the producers, with the head producer, Greer Shepard, one of the first things she said to me was, your books don't break down to a 42-minute teleplay very easily. And, and my immediate response to that was, thank God, if they did, you really shouldn't be reading them like that. And so, you know, I, I knew right then, and they said, you know, well, we can't, you know, fit one of your books into, you know, a single episode. We just can't do it. And, you know, with it being on basic cable, when it was on A&E, they exerted a certain amount of force, you know, that each episode should have a beginning, a middle, and end. And right now, like that, the way the trends are running is, is that you have a case and a situation that will run an entire season like that. But, you know, whenever we were starting out, they kind of flexed their muscles and said, no, we want people to be able to start in on like, you know, episode 10 and still be able to realize what's going on. But now with the streaming situation being the way it was, you know, that, that format kind of changed a lot when we switched over and went with Netflix. But I think, you know, you, you have to kind of be open to the idea that, you know, that these people hopefully are going to know what they're doing and be open to the idea that it might be a little bit different from what it is that, you know, that you had in mind. 
some of the differences, you know, being that, uh, I mean, the walls in the books is obviously a little bit older, like, and uh, Henry uh, is a little bit older. And that was actually, I guess, maybe the first, you know, controversy that I had, you know, with the producers. We were in one of the meetings, and they said, well, we're, we're thinking about making Walt and Henry about 10 years younger than they are in the books, you know, where they're Vietnam veterans. And I had the immediate redneck cowboy, you know, author response where I was like, well, now why are we doing that? And they said, well, because we'd really like to, you know, run the show for about 10 years or so. And we'd rather not have the characters on walkers, you know, by the time we get to the end, you know. And so I, oh, yeah. I had a hard time arguing that point. You know, I kind of pulled my horns back in and, you know, kind of realized what it is that they were attempting to do. Look at and, Boy, uh, so that, I, I think you kind of just have to be open to that. Boy, is that a producer's answer, though, man. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, they no. have to think about things that, you know, maybe the author, you know, it's never I did never entertained, you know, my my thought process, you know, I mean. I just I I was amazed that they were even thinking about making a television show out of the sheriff of the least populated county, the least populated state. You know, I I literally questioned, do you guys think this is a good idea? Do you really? And it was nice too, like that, because you know Grant, uh, Greer came back, you know, with a a response to that, you know, and she had said, you know, well. The thing we like about Walt is is that he's got a code that he lives by, that he's you know a, a genuine you know, good guy who cares, you know, about the people, you know, that are in his constituency, like that, that are in his county. And uh, she said, you know, we've kind of gone through this, you know, anti-hero thing that's been going on, you know, since the 1960s or so. And she said, I just, I feel like, you know, that maybe people are ready, you know, for a guy who's who's going to do the right thing, that actually cares about people and, you know, isn't going to be making meth, you know, in his bathtub or burying bodies <laughs> in the backyard or something. And I think she was right. You know, she kind of tapped into a little bit of that zeitgeist of, that made for a little bit of the response to the television show. And certainly I oppose, you know, the, to the books too. And you got to have a big picture kind of idea, I think, you know, to do that kind of work be able to work with, you know, all of those different people and all those different entities, you know, of, of, you know, getting a studio to bite, you know, and getting them to, to want to make, you know, a pilot and then getting a, an advertisers like that to jump on board like that. Once you get, you know, a, a channel like that or a network to actually bite and think about making it into a series. I mean, it's a lot of hurdles to overcome. In some ways, I guess it could be, you know, compared, you know, with getting an agent and getting a publisher, you know, and then, you know, getting enough of them into enough bookstores, you know, to where you start actually actually getting some traction and uh, and the book starts to sell like that but it's a business aspect you know i guess maybe that i you know would rather not have to to contend with you know to be honest i i'd rather focus on the writing myself yeah yeah you were talking before about you know binge watching and you know how somebody comes into a series and stuff what about now with the books if i'm a reader and i've never i hear this podcast for the first time and i've never heard anything about the TV series, the books or something. Can I start anywhere? Should I start with number one? Where where should readers uh, jump in? I think, you know, that that's, you know, one of the, the, the challenges, you know, of writing a series is that, that you do have to be able to have that continuation of the characters and their world like that. But I do think, you know, you also have to make, you know, each book has to be accessible. Each novel has to be something that somebody, you know, is just wandering through the airport like that and they have a four hour layover like that and they're desperate for a book and they see yours and they pick it up that they're not going to throw it down after, you know, getting about 20 pages in because they don't understand anything that's going on, you know. So I think it's a it's a tight rope that you have to walk. And sometimes you're more successful than you are in others. I think there are probably only two books in the series that I would say, you know, you shouldn't start with. But always, you're always hoping that there are going to be enough of uh, of that first book out there. You know, the thing I'm always advising people is if you think that these characters and this place are something that you're really going to want to, you know, read the entirety of the series, then yeah, go back and try and grab that first book, The Cold Dish, you know, to get yourself started. But certainly there's no reason why it is that anyone couldn't pick up The Land of Wolves to get started on it. If anything, it'll just make you more curious about, you know, who Walt is and who Vic is and who Henry is and where all these characters came from and where it is that they're going. I was just going to say that, you know, it seems to me one thing that you really do really well is uh, I, I think the series is very accessible no matter where you come in, which I, which I know is a huge challenge. Uh, so I would say anybody listening to this and, you know, is interested, just whatever book you see in the story, go ahead and grab it and get going. 
thank you. I appreciate that. Like it's, it's. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where it's a, it's an ugly beast that rears its head once you're already, you know, on board. You know, because you start writing books, you know, in a series like that, and then some of those challenges just kind of have to either rise to them or else, you know, you you you, know, you continue at your own peril. Yeah, you know, I think that's always going to be on your mind like that. But then it kind of goes to that core of the writing process too like that i mean whenever i'm I'm teaching classes or doing a workshop or something uh, i'll tell students you know if, if the example i always use is the red hot gun barrel swung around under the looming mountains you know well you know the, the gun barrel is always red hot and the mountains are always looming like that and so you know you're gonna have to find a new way to say this you know i think that that's you know kind of the challenge what you hope is going to be good writing that you know you, you got to find a different way to say something and, you know, and that can even go into a larger scale, you know, whenever you're going back, you know, and reiterating maybe some aspects of the character's experiences or their lives. You can retell some of that stuff like that, but you better find a new way to do it just because, you know, if you do have, you know, a readership that's going to continue on with the series, they don't want to read the same things over and over again. You know, you're just being repetitious, you know, so you got to find a new way to say it. You know, that, that's your job, I think. Well, I, I can't let you go without asking about dogs. Because, you tell, because of, you know, and not to confuse, I, I don't want to confuse characters with, with the writer and that sort of stuff, but you tell us about dogs. I mean, obviously there's a connection there. <laughs> that was actually one of the things I was warned against. You know, that was, uh, it? <laughs> uh, you know, whenever you start out, you know, there's always a, a plethora of, you know, of other writers that are more than willing to, uh, you know, give you advice, you know, on what you should do and what you shouldn't do. You know, that, that was one of the big pieces of advice I got was they said, you know, well, don't give your protagonist any pets because then you have to try and, you know, take care of those pets and you'll mess up and you'll do something wrong and everybody will be angry and all this stuff, you know. And I just, I thought, you know, well, I've got a whole ranch full of animals that I've got to take care of. I don't see why Walt can't take care of one dog, it didn't seem like. <laughs> and this kind of goes back to, you know, that portion of the show where we were talking about, you know, you know armed people talking to themselves. You know, basically I'm, I'm, I'm writing about an armed individual who, you know, drives all over Wyoming, you know, trying to, you know, solve some situations like in these cases. And I could either have him talk to himself or I could have him talk to the dog. And I, you know, we all talk to our animals. Like it just seemed to me that that made a lot more sense as using the dog as a sounding board. And I, I have to admit that, you know, the dog has actually become, you know, one of my favorite characters as, as I move along in the series like that, because uh, he, he does have an understanding of Walt that maybe none of the other characters do. It, it, I think it was in Dark Horse you know, where, you know, Walt got out of the truck and looked back at the dog and said, you know, stay in the truck and don't play with the radio. And then he turned and shut the door and walked away. And he says to himself, you know, it was our own private joke. He knew he could play with the radio if he wanted to. Like, and so it, it kind of like hopefully lends an element, you know, to the books, you know, where Walt is alone. But still, you know, able to to bounce some ideas off of, uh, you know, maybe the individual that's maybe the closest to him, like that. And the dog was actually based off of a uh, a dog that I had, you know, who who's passed away, you know, in, over the years, like that. But he was, uh, I, I, you know, rescued him from the pound in Sheridan, and and it was only later that I discovered that he was part Saint Bernard. You know, he you know, would go through about a bag of dog food every two or three days like that. But uh, <laughs> he, he became a, a wonderful character, you know, for Walt, you know, who I think, you know, needs as much help, you know, as he can uh, can muster, you know, on a day to day basis. And one of the funner aspects of the books, like that, because a lot of the humor, I think, you know, tends to come from you know, the reactions that the dog has to Walt. And that for me just is, uh, you know, anytime anybody tells you you shouldn't do something, you know, in a literary sense, you know, I'm always you know, enough of an outlaw that I'm always thinking, OK, well, how can I do this? Of course. And, uh, of course. you know, that, that, you know, having the dog in there, you know, I remember people were telling me, oh, you can't change your location. Whatever you do, don't ever leave Wyoming. Well, third book takes place almost entirely in Philadelphia. Uh, the fourth book, half of it takes place in Vietnam in 1967. Depth of Winter almost entirely takes place, you know, down in Mexico. I think, you know, that to, to, you know, that goes back to some of the stuff we were talking about as far as like, you know, growing and, and developing, you know, I think it's important. The other one that, that I should finish up with, which was kind of funny, was the interaction between Walt and Vic Moretti, his, uh, his transplant uh, under sheriff from Philadelphia. There's a, a sexual attraction between those characters. And I remember starting off and and all these other authors telling me that, you know, well, you can have, you know, sexual tension between your characters, but you can't have anything happen for like, you know, 17 or 18 books. 
And my immediate response to that was, <laughs> what kind of women are you dating anyway? Like, it would wait yeah, really? 17 or 18 years, you know, for something to quote unquote happen. You yeah, know, that's like, a lot of nah, sexual nah. frustration. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like it's, I, I went ahead and had something happen in the third book and I wrote my first sex scene, which, which is approximately three sentences long, which kind of gives you an indication of just how much of a chicken shit I am. <laughs> and uh, I, I wrote that scene. It was three sentences long. And I remember being on tour for it in Portland like that. And there was a woman that wanted to ask questions at the very beginning like you know and i was like yeah just let's wait till we get through and then we'll you know do a q a and she had her hand shot up immediately as soon as i finished up and i said sure what's your question and she goes i want to talk to you about that sex scene and kindness goes unpunished and i'm like oh boy here we go <laughs> and uh, i said yeah well what about it and she goes it went on forever <laughs> and i was like um it was only three sentences long. Like, and she kind of turned bright red. Like, and everybody in the room is laughing. And I looked at her and I go, "How many times did you read it?" And she goes, "I read it a bunch of times." Like, and so I, I felt kind of, kind of vindicated at that point. I felt like it was okay. So. Wow! <laughs> they looked into each other other's eyes. They did it. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, like they use the Heming, use the Hemingway analogy. It's seven eighths of the, the iceberg is under the water, and that's all you need to know. So, <laughs> well, I'm kind of thinking that, in, you know, in, that's kind of a compliment, though. If she thought that the, you know, the sex scene really lasted a long time, gave her a lot of satisfaction. Oh, absolutely! Like it, absolutely! Like if she was game, like you know, that's uh, that's all I really care about, to be honest with you. Yeah, and we actually should wrap it up because I've had you for a, you know an hour basically now, so. But, Craig, you did great, though. This is awesome. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope that you'll come on with Jim and I again when the new book comes out. Or I know you've oh, got to- absolutely. Just, like, let me know. Like, and we'll go from there. Like, that'd be fantastic. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. I will see you later. Take care. Sounds good. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>